Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. I'm really excited to have Brian Wright here. He is the founder of the Bright, uh, Brian, not Bright, Brian Wright International, host of Success Profiles Radio and publisher of Success Profiles Magazine. Brian is a multi-published author and helps people publish their own books as well. So Brian, I know I gave you a brief intro on you, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. Wow, thank you so much for that. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, when I was a kid, I always thought that I wanted to be a writer. I always thought that I wanted to be a teacher. And I've done both of those things. Wow. So <laughs> it's been fun. In fact, um, back in the 90s, I taught at a two-year business college in Nebraska. I taught public speaking, English composition, and business math. Now, the thing they all had in common is they were required courses. Hmm. So chances are, even though I wasn't the only person that was teaching all three of those courses, chances are that if you graduated from this school, you probably had me in at least one of your classes. So I try to make it as fun as possible because people do have a fear of public speaking and some people don't enjoy writing papers and a lot of people certainly don't like math. So I had to make it fun. And so I think I did pretty well at, at doing that. And What's interesting is when I was a kid, I enjoyed writing stories. In fact, in study hall, I would write episodes of existing TV shows just because that's what I knew. I knew what Lost in Space was. I knew what the underdog cartoon was. I loved those shows growing up. In fact, when we would go visit my grandparents and go to church with them, I, apparently I fidgeted a lot and mom would just hand me a notepad and pen and I would just start writing and I was fine. So she knew how to calm me down, <laughs> give him something to write on and something to write with, and he'll be fine until church is over with. So wow. that was, that was interesting. And then when I was in high school, I decided to write a time travel novel. I wrote myself into a corner and didn't know how to get out. So I gave up and stopped and creative writing, fiction writing, as it turns out, is not really my sandbox. I love helping people with nonfiction specifically with business and personal development kinds of books. And in a couple of cases, I've helped people write their autobiographies. And if they're interesting stories, I'll take it. I don't say yes to everyone who asks me to help them because I have to enjoy the project and I have to enjoy working with you. If I think I'm not going to have fun with you, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And that's the beauty of entrepreneurship, right? That you can yeah. decide who and who not, who you are and who you're not going to work with. Right, exactly. And, you know, it's fine, you know, and I, I don't say no a lot, but when I do say no, it can be very empowering. Mm. The energy lift off of my shoulders is just unmistakable. I'm like, okay, I made the right decision here. And it frees me up to do other things that turn out to be more fun. Usually another project will replace it that I end up enjoying a lot more. Mm. so that that's just it's great and you know it's interesting I was just thinking the other day about my current age and potentially how many more years left I have and I started thinking that's a finite amount of time how many books can I write between now and then and then the idea of being really judicious about really judicious about who I work with between now and then becomes even more important because it's like, do I want my name attached to this? Now as a ghostwriter, I'm anonymous. That's by definition, that's true. So my name is usually not on the work, but mm. at the same time, is this a project I want to take? And will this potentially take me away from something that I might enjoy more? So sometimes those are choices and decisions, but for the most part, I, I love helping people get their message out to the world. I love people helping write their books. If they would rather write their own books, I will coach them, be their accountability partner, offer suggestions, give them homework, read, edit, whatever, to help you get across the finish line. So I work with people in both scenarios. Either you want to write the book yourself and you want help, or you would just rather say, oh, just take it off my hands and do it for me. So I do oh, that. <laughs> Sometimes I know when I was writing my book, I'm like, man, I just need to give this to somebody else. I'm, I'm tired of doing it. I was that stubborn person that pretty much did everything myself. There was a few things that like the artwork cover and the formatting that I did uh, farm out to a third party to get that taken yeah. care of <laughs> everything Absolutely. else I did myself. But the next yeah. book, uh, I'll probably end up getting some help from somebody because I want to make sure it's a lot, a lot better, a little bit lengthier. It was a nice 
I guess it was about 80 pages, which yeah. was a nice read, but yeah. I was, my, my goal actually was about 80 to 120 pages. So it's funny yeah. how I ended it about at the lower end of the goal. Yeah. <laughs> so that's good. Well, I, I'd be glad to have that conversation with you if that's something you want to do at some point or with anyone watching or listening. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll be having that conversation for sure. Yeah. So I appreciate you giving that background story and actually right there at the end, what you mentioned about, you are talking about the end of your, your days, how many your years you have left and everything and how many books you have left in you it reminds me of John Maxwell actually talking about that and how I, f- I forget the story. I don't know if it was in a book or me hearing him on stage or where I heard him tell this story at. But he was going to a publisher, and one of the things he thought about was, if I go to this publisher, and I think at this point he already had like over 20 books, which is a ton of books for somebody mm-hmm. and for anybody, but he somehow finds more books to write. But anyways, he, he was talking about how, well, they're going to ask me, you know, well, how many books do you have left in you? And so he starts writing out, and he even surprised himself that he probably list off like another 10. I was like, man, that's crazy. But mm-hmm. and they were really excited that he had that many more in him because they were afraid as well. Well, you're getting older, you know, you might have one or two maybe, but when he right. came out with 10, they're like, all right, this is a done deal. We, we know what we can work with and what we got. Right. So, and they were probably trying to figure out what type of contract to offer him too. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so, so like, I do, do want to dive a contract into- for one or two, or do we offer you a longer term contract for 10? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Up so that you don't ever go anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> John Maxwell's a brand. I mean, a huge brand. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, everybody calls him the father of leadership. I mean, is yeah. he pretty much is. I mean, there's nobody else out there that's been talking about it near as long and has as many books out there about that. Right. So, but speaking of that, which obviously John Maxwell is kind of branding himself, the father of leadership, like we said, how does a book help you out with branding as a leader or not as a leader, sorry, just branding yourself in general? Yeah, it's interesting because if you are trying to get on somebody's stage to speak, and let's just say they're, they're thinking of three people, I mean, three is a nice round number, mm-hmm. and you're the only one of those three that has a book, I think you probably have a leg up because they think, well, that person must be the expert mm-hmm. in this topic. So whether it's true or not may be another story, but there's the perception that you're the expert. And so there's a lot more value that you can provide. I mean, sometimes the event planner might agree to buy a book for everybody in their audience at a discounted rate. And then you can sign books in the back of the room afterwards, or they might let you sell something in the back of the room afterwards, and they might take some kind of a split, whatever that looks like, but it can help your brand. In fact, I worked with a client who created an online course, and then we created a book off of his course, and then he uses the book to redirect people outside of his universe into his universe back to his course. Wow. So sometimes and you, you, can use, you can use your book for a lot of different things. In fact, I frequently ask people, what's your call to action going to be? And sometimes I sort of get this reaction, you know, where you tilt your head and go, what? Well, I mean, what do you want people to think, do, believe, or act after they've read your book? Do you want them to join your community? Do you want them to buy something else? Do you want them to hire you to be a coach? Do you want them to hire you to speak on stage? Do you want to invite them to an event where you can sell other stuff at, their, at your free event? What do you want to have happen? It's a lead generation magnet. Mm, man, that's that's so good because that's something I didn't think about it. For me, it was more just about getting that message out there and for mm-hmm. the at the time, my my future children yeah. and just having that message out there for them and other people to be able to read and learn from yeah. my story and some of my story, yeah. but never thought about the the call to action from that. So that's yeah. very interesting. What what are some yeah. of those call to actions that you could take or that you could put inside that book for people to take? Yeah. So a couple of great examples, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad was all about selling his cash flow game. Mm. Now he provided a ton of value. He would get you to think about money very, very differently. He gets you to think about what an asset is and what a liability is different from what other people were talking about at the time and still different than a lot of people talk about now. But he talks about how you can really learn these principles in real time by playing his cash flow game. And at the end of the book, there's a page that invites you to buy his cash flow game. Now you can play it online. Mm-hmm. Another great example, uh, T. Hardrecker's <laughs> Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. All the way throughout the book, he'll sprinkle in the idea that you can come to his free a week, weekend event. It's a three-day thing. In fact, I went one time to his free event. Tons of value expounding on a bunch of the ideas that were in his book, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. 
But at the event, his team, after every session, will sell you, try to sell you into a quantum leap program or a, a mastermind or a course or something. So they must sell enough of those to make it worth it to let you come for free. They know a yeah. certain percentage of people will buy. Yeah. And I'm sure they have the math worked out where they know approximately how much money each person spends with them, invests with them, who ends up buying something. So of course they can afford to let you come for free. So that was his whole end game for writing the book was to get you to come to his event. And then he uses that event to sell stuff afterwards. You mm. can invite people to buy a coaching program. You can invite people to hire you one-on-one. -on -one. You can invite people to come to your event. Uh, there's just a lot of different things. It's just think about how do you want to invite people into your world once the book is done? Because once they've read your book, you don't want that to be the end. You, you want to involve them somehow. It's like, great, you read my book. How else can I help you? Man, that's, that's that is so awesome. And I think about some of the books that I've read. I know I cannot remember the name of Daniel Blue's book, but I know in, throughout his book, he said, hey, if you want to learn more about this, go here. And he kept talking about that. And there's several other books that, hey, they're talking about something. Here's that free resource online for you to take a look at. I want to say mm -hmm. Gino Wickman with uh, EOS and Attraction and some of those other books that he does a lot of that as well. It's like, hey, if we've been talking about this, if you want this free resource, go here. And so it's just kind of yeah. plugging in. And I haven't taken up on any of those, but I'm sure it's like, hey, they get your name and email, something like that. Mm -hmm. So where they get that lead gen from you, but then you become that warm lead, which is such an important thing, especially for entrepreneurs is having more of those warm leads or even hot leads, especially if you can catch them right then and there, they're probably more of that hot lead versus mm -hmm. that cold lead which is essentially a cold call for people that don't really understand that. So it's like a cold call versus you're calling a friend who has been interested in your product or has said, Hey, I've been thinking about getting coaching from you. And then you're like, Oh, okay. That's a hot lead. Like let, let's have a conversation now. The so same yeah. thing. So that's, yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to invite people into your world somehow mm -hmm. after they're done mm -hmm. reading your book. A lot of people think I just want to tell my story. Okay. The people who know you really well will probably buy your book because it's you, mm -hmm. but there are over 7 billion other people who don't know you. So why, why will they buy your book? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And that's where usually the, the sales start from. And it's really cool. Just kind of talk a little bit about my story. When I finally published my book, it's been cool. I haven't gotten a ton of sales since the initial start or anything like that, but that's on me. But it's really cool still to see that you know, a couple of sales here, a couple of sales there. And something that I've put out uh, back in June of last year is still going through and people are still picking it up and reading it and buying mm -hmm. it. And so it's kind of cool that I did something and it's still taking, I guess, taking action, helping benefit people. But then also, of course, I'm seeing a little bit of money come back into my bank account, yeah. which is really cool, which I think is another great thing about a book especially if you have that call to action, it'll come back and you're helping more people. And you'll be able to reach more of an audience because buying a book is way more reasonable than buying any kind of coaching program or service that somebody right. provides, right? So that's that, that first step to get into that. Right. Now, it, obviously you're pretty, you're, you're pretty biased on books and everything, but I'm curious your thoughts because you mentioned about getting on stages, which I'm really glad you mentioned that, that if kind of gives you that leg up getting mm -hmm. on stage do you feel like a book has more weight to it than a, say a podcast because I know some people maybe they've done a podcast but they haven't done a book or maybe vice versa which one do you feel has more weight when it comes to getting on stage or just getting in front of people in general I think they're both important because you can use them to synergize off of one another mm. If people are thinking about hiring you to come on stage, they can listen to your podcast and listen to how you present yourself. If they want to read your book, they can get a sense for the content that you provide that you might be able to share on their stage and just expand upon even more. And when someone gets to experience you live on stage, it's, it's different because now you get to see the energy and feel the energy behind what you've read. Hmm. And that's really, really important. I do think a book is a legacy item that, you know, it'll just, it'll be with you. You know, Success Profiles, Conversations with High Achiever. I've got volume one and I've also got 
volume two. These are actually uh, compilations from some of the best interviews from my show. And so I've synergized both of them by taking the best interviews and putting them in books and people will buy the book if they sometimes people who bought my book haven't heard my show mm. and my show is now 10 years old sometimes people who've heard my show didn't know I have a book and so I talk about my books during my show you know when I come back from break sometimes people who hear my show don't know I publish a magazine success profiles magazine and people who read my magazine may not know that I help people write their books. Because what I do is I have my graphic designer fill the empty spaces of the magazine with little ads for different things that I do. And I have gotten business off of that. You know, I took a copy of my magazine to a coffee house to meet somebody uh, and, and a friend of his. And I brought a copy of the magazine and his friend was looking and he saw the ad. And he says, you help people write their books? I said, yeah, you think about writing a book? He said, yeah. I said, do you want to do it yourself or do you want to help? He says, I want help. I said, let's meet back here on Monday. And he hired me. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. <laughs> wow, that's yeah, awesome. All because, all because I was using empty space in my own magazine to promote mm. stuff that I do. Mm. And I happen to print that out. It's a digital magazine, so I don't print them out every month. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, I was going to ask that question because I know magazines are kind of dead in a sense of the yeah. printed version. So yeah. that makes a lot more sense that's digital. Yeah. But successprofilesmagazine.com, you can go there and pick your subscription option. The first seven days is a dollar. And then there's a monthly, there's an annual, then there's a pay once and never pay again option. And mm. who wouldn't do that? Right. <laughs> because you have access to everything on the site, every single issue, monthly issue, everything, single special edition, uh, every single extra interview that I've conducted with people. There's a lot of that on that site. A lot. In fact, you could mm. probably read something every single day on that site and probably for a good six months, you'll read something new every single day. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I want to point out that you mentioned, without mentioning the different tiers, and then you, you mentioned there about the one you pay one time and it's forever. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, listen to that. That is a the perfect way to sell some kind of service that you have or a product that you have is create those tiers like that and make that tier one that you really want people to buy from. That's like at mm -hmm. the movie theaters where they have the small, medium, and large. In the medium, they really want you to buy the large, but the mm -hmm. medium is like whatever price it is. It's only just a little bit more to get the large. So you're like, mm -hmm. well, it's only a little bit more. So they buy the large. So kind of the same yeah. concept. I don't know if that's what your plan was with those tiers, yeah. but kind of the same right. concept. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, if, if you're buying the pay once forever, that's basically the equivalent of paying annually twice. It's a little less yeah. than that. So, I mean, why yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's, that's genius marketing right there. So, you know, take a lesson right there for those of y'all yeah. listening that well, that's a way to really structure the tiers behind your programs, your services, your products, whatever you're selling that mm -hmm. you can structure that tier like that. But I, but it is interesting to me that you have all these things and I love that they're all connected together before I go into how you went and connected them all together. How did you overcome that hurdle? Because you sound very confident and just talk about how, oh, I had this product and this product and this product. And within each one of these, I talk about the other ones. And just kind of from an outside perspective, I know you're not being selfish or egotistical or anything, but right. for those starting out, me talking about my product and about my product on all my other products, it sounds like I'm being very self-centered and egotistical. How did you, if you had that hurdle, mental hurdle, how did you overcome that mental hurdle? It's coming from a place of service because mm. the radio show is free. You can listen to it for free anytime. Mm. So when I tell people to hear my show, it's free. I don't really get anything out of it per se, except that I get to share a lot of great information and I get to connect you with people that I've interviewed. I've interviewed some really amazing people on my show. You know, Darren Hardy was a guest on my show. Jack wow. Hanfield has been on. Sharon Lecter, Mark Victor Hansen, uh, Chris Powell, Dan Locke, Kevin Harrington. Stedman Graham's been on my show. So I've had some really cool people on my show. And it's a great way for people to listen to what they have to share and potentially buy their stuff, get into their world too. And the whole caveat to this, and what, this is something that I've started, started being a lot more proactive about in the last couple of years or so, my guest list is my lead list. Mm. Some of my guests are now clients of mine. Wow, that's awesome. 
Yeah. Man, I, I didn't realize we were going to get so much marketing out of, <laughs> out of this episode. I mean, there are just so many marketing tips you're just giving us here. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love that. That is awesome. But well, actually, I want you to dive into that. I know I said we were going to dive into something else, but I really want you to dive into that about how these people that are guests on your podcast, then all of a sudden now they become leads for you. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I talk to people, you know, during the breaks. My, my show is a live radio show. So I get to talk with them every quarter hour privately without the mm. audience hearing. Mm. And then if they have time to talk at the end, we'll talk at the end for a few minutes. But if in my research, if it's real clear they don't have a book, I just make a mental note. I'm going to ask them about that. And I mention it during the show too, you know, coming out of break and whatnot. And sometimes the guest will say, I heard you said that you help people write their books. I do. Have you done a book yet? No. I said, is that something you've thought about? I've thought about it. I said, let's have a conversation about that. And sometimes they, they agree to hire me and sometimes not, but that's okay. You know, it has the, the, the timing has to match up. The, the financial end of it has to match up. Uh, sometimes other things need to be taken care of first, like they're currently launching something else. So I get all of that. I just make notes and follow up later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sometimes people have hired me because I asked. Mm. Now, I think it's an important thing for, for people to know and talking to myself as well, that you have to ask you, you have, you have to, ask. to ask or, or it's already a no anyways. Yeah. You know? I mean, think about this. If you're afraid to ask and Jack Canfield and Mark Johansson wrote a brilliant book called the Aladdin factor. And when they talk about, let's just say asking someone out on a date and you're thinking, Oh, they would never go out with me. Well, think about it. Do you have a date with this person now? No. <laughs> Well, if you ask, they could say yes, but what's the worst thing that could happen? They could say no. And then will you still have a date with them? No. Okay, so you're no worse off for asking. If you don't ask, you have the exact same outcome as if you do ask and they say no. So just hmm. ask. There's yeah. only upside. Yep. Well, that's, will you I mean, die, will you die by asking? No, probably not. <laughs> well, it depends on how you ask. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but you're right. And, and a lot of that really comes down to ego getting in the way and, yeah. I, and kind of going back to what you, you mentioned about serving again, that's, that's kind of ego getting in the way of thinking that people are going to think so much about me. Cause yeah. what I found is that people really don't pay that much attention to you. I mean, they, <laughs> they pay attention as much as they want to, but at yeah. the end of the day, they're more centered on themselves and what's going on in their life yeah. than what you or I are doing. Exactly. And I love, I love what you just said, because I think if people get oversensitive to the fact that someone is marketing themselves, they're probably afraid of marketing themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they're super sensitive to other people marketing. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, you just want people's money. No, not really. I, I want to do business with you. I don't need to see that's a thing. This is a, this is a huge mindset shift. Mm -hmm. I used to operate out of need instead of want. And I've made, I've done some really dumb things. I've taken on horrible roommates because I needed the money versus I wanted the money or I wanted the experience of living with whoever that was. Mm. When you operate out of need, you will work with just about anybody who wants to throw money in your face. And I'll tell you what, it's really empowering to say no. Like we talked about earlier, it's like, oh, it's not going to be a fit. Mm. So how, how long did it take you to get over that? Cause obviously you had to start this, their companies at some point, the radio show was 10 years ago. Yeah. But how long did it take for you to get past that? Cause I know as a first time entrepreneur or people really getting started, they're in the weeds still, they really just yeah. try to take anything they can. And yeah. And you know, it's interesting. I ask my guests frequently, how do you know what to say yes to and what to say no to? And Dan Locke said something very interesting. He said, well, you have to say yes to almost everything at the beginning because you're getting started. But as you get more established, you can start to be more judicious about what you say yes to and what you say no to. And then when your business is rolling and you're really established, you say no first almost all the time. Hmm. In fact, some people will say no just to see if you follow up or not. They're testing you. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's and that's really a position of power when you can sit there and oh, nah, like, you know, say it however, and then just to test that person and see if they're mm -hmm. really committed to that, because that's a big thing, especially as you start getting more successful in your business starts growing that 
you are going to have to protect that time. And, and that's, yeah. I guess, a way without having to increase your prices that you can kind of protect that time, make sure you're working for yeah. people that want to actually work. Right. And when you raise your prices, you attract a different caliber of client. Mm. You just do. Because here's the thing. When you're going out buying a car, some people don't want to buy the Hyundai. Nothing against Hyundais. I drive a Nissan. So, I mean, not, not a really super high-end car, right? It, it gets me where I want to go and that's fine. Could I drive a more expensive car? Sure. Do I want to? No, not right now. But some people will only buy a Lexus or an Audi or a BMW. They won't buy a Hyundai or a Nissan or a Toyota. So if you are willing to pay for a high-end car, but all you're offering is a lower-end car, you'll be dismissed. It's like, I don't want that. I don't care if you're the lowest price. In fact, if you're the lowest price, I may wonder if you're any good. Mm. Mm, that's such a such, such a good point. Do you mind diving into that a little bit more, just talking about that? I'm Absolutely. sure you've had to deal with that with your, your books and everything. So Yeah. I mean, when I started, I wasn't charging anywhere near what I charge now. And there are people who charge more than I do, certainly, but I just needed a portfolio and mm. I was attracting broke people because I was offering to write their books for next to nothing compared to what I'm charging now. Mm. And when you work with people who don't have money, it's interesting. The people that pay the less, expe they expect the most. Yeah. They really do. And some of them are just a pain in the butt to work with. Yeah. That's like, that makes me think of a meme that I've seen. It's like, hey, the $500 and the, the client, you, hey, $500. And they're like, oh, da, 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 da. they have all these questions about it. And then you say, hey, $50,000, client says, all right, money sent. <laughs> yep, yep, I love that one. Yeah, is, I love I mean, that it's so one. true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. And and the people that are willing to pay more usually don't have an issue paying it. They usually have it. They usually mm -hmm. have money. Yeah, yeah. Now, the caveat to all of that is if you're going to charge more, you better be providing a lot more value and you better be really good at what you do. Mm -hmm. And you learn that by continuing to do. And so I built myself up to where I am now. And I'm sure that at some point I'll raise my prices again. But what's really interesting is when someone asks me like three, four, five years ago, you know, to help them write their book. And then they don't say they don't say yes right away. And now they want to work with me. It's like my rates have changed. I just want you to know, oh, I'm sure they have where you at now. And I'll tell them, okay, that's, you should be, you should be charging that much now. Yeah. You should yeah. have said yes five years ago. You right, really should right. have. And I'm sure you've had some of them try and come back. Well, I mean, you offered this price this, this time. It's like uh, that. Yeah. Three to five years ago, there was no right. guarantee on that pricing. But it's, right. It's funny have you ever watched the game show way. network where you watch the old episodes of let's make a deal and yeah. a brand new car is only $3,000. Yeah. Let's buy that car. Right. <laughs> I'll pay that yeah. for a new car. <laughs> yeah, for a new one. But that's the problem. You can pay, well, you maybe pay that for that old one if it's not a cool old car. <laughs> You're not getting that brand new car for that price. Yeah. And so I, I'm sorry, but, you know, things change. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you rummage through your closet and you go through really old magazines and you might see an ad subscribe for a year to this magazine for only $19.97, you'll be paying seven or eight bucks per issue now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, sure, I'll subscribe to your magazine for that. <laughs> well, that's not how much we charge now. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, crazy how people come up with that, but definitely the pricing, that's something you have to really work on and, and figure out what, what works for you now. And then, of course, go up as your worth gets higher, but as well as your service mm -hmm. gets better because yeah. yeah, your service should get better as you get better and get more Absolutely. experience. Absolutely. <laughs> and when people start telling you, oh, your rate is really reasonable, it's like, oh, maybe that's a clue I should raise my rates. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's yeah. really reasonable. <laughs> kind of like I wasn't expecting it to be that low. I'm like, okay. And, and here's the other, the other piece to that. Lots of times when people price their services, they price what they can afford to pay, not what the customer can afford to pay. Mm, mm, that's, that's a, that's a great point. And how do you, how do you get over that hurdle? I mean, that's another like mental block yeah. to get over. You have to be willing to invest in yourself if you expect other people to invest in your services. Mm. 
Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Like a lot of people talk about, you know, you have to get a coach before you're going to be able to coach somebody. Right. Or just things right. of that nature. If you're not willing to invest in yourself, if you're not willing to spend money on you and your business, you probably aren't going to get a lot of people who will pay you the kind of money that you want. Mm. Mm. Because Such money has point. to be in motion. The velocity of money has to be there. Yeah. Hmm, such a good point, man. So, so many great points, but I want to go back finally to what I said we were going to go to before going okay. down all these little rabbit holes, which have been okay. awesome. But how in the world did you go for uh, like just having the, the radio show, oh. doing your own book pu publishing, helping yeah. people publish their books, doing the magazine? How, those yeah. I see how they all come together and combine, but well, how I, in the world did you do start doing all of those? I, I just started by doing one thing at a time. Hmm. The radio show was first. I just wanted to interview amazing people on my show and learn from them. And yes, I'm paying for the experience of running my show. So I wasn't making money on it right away, but I wanted to interview amazing people and, and develop a reputation as a great interviewer, which I, I think I have now. And, you know, 10 years later here, I still am over 450 episodes later, but I was hoping that would springboard into something. And I knew at some point, if I had a lot of really amazing, amazing people that I could repurpose some of those interviews into a book, but I had to build up to getting the kind of guests that I would be willing to do that with. So it took a while and about a year and a half into it, PR agencies started reaching out to me. It's like, Hey, I heard, I've heard your show. Would you be interested in having so-and-so on your show? Yeah. So I don't have to hunt very hard for a guest. In fact, I don't take every pitch. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, if you got names like Dan Locke no. on there. <laughs> Again, it's, it's great to be able to say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, going one thing at a time. I think a lot of yeah. people, especially with social media, they start seeing how all these successful people are in seven or eight businesses. And, you know, I think it's Ed Milet that talks about that. Or, or for, I forget who, somebody... And I'm sure there's plenty of them that talk about it now, but really you need to figure out how to make your first million really in one business mm -hmm. or really get one business going very well before you start focusing on a second or a third. Because, right. you know, there's that saying out there that most millionaires have seven sources of income. Well, they yeah. started out with one source first. Right. And then they branched off into those others. They, yeah, they, they didn't, they didn't try doing it all at once. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They really perfected that. So I want to go back real quick to you, you know, I, I know you, you mentioned about how you help people publish books, but yeah. what are some of the things that you see that you really almost have to coach people through to get them to actually get that book out? I know we talked offline about how people sure. have even paid you to write a book for them, for them to not even write the book. And that wasn't because of you, that was because right. of them. So t tell us, I, right. I want to hear a couple of these stories about people and how you've helped them overcome the hurdles, yeah. the mental blocks they have to writing that book, to getting their message out there. I think in a lot of cases, there's a self-limiting belief that people think that someone's not going to want to read what they've written mm. or they wonder if anyone will care about their message and they start sharing their story. And I think, oh, you need to tell this story. Not just because I want you to pay me, but because you need to share this story. Yeah. You really do. What you've gone through is a much bigger deal than you think it is. And if you can help even one person in their journey who's going through something similar, it'll be totally worth it. I mean, if you're writing your book to have an impact on people's lives, a book is a great way to do it. It really, really is. Hmm. I love that. And you're so right. I know... I had people telling me, well, well nobody's going to read your book. And I don't know how many copies I've actually sold because I did all mine through KDP, but still people read it. There was at least some people mm -hmm. that read my book and yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not a somebody yet. You know, I will be one day, but right now yeah. I'm still, I guess, if you will, a nobody. Now, not a lot of people know me yet. Yeah. People are reading that book in, in yeah. your message. And you know, what's really interesting. I went to an event probably three weeks ago in Dallas. And I released a book last December called The Greatest Lessons I Learned from My Dad. Mm. My dad passed last year in February. It's been almost a year now. Oh man, I'm sorry and, to hear that. I've, I've, you know, my dad passed away about 40 years ago and it's, yeah, it's tough. It is tough. So I decided to write some of the greatest lessons I learned from him and I invited other people to contribute chapters also. 
And the book has sold pretty well. And I went to this event in Dallas and I had several people come up to me saying, I'm reading your book now. I love it. Thank you. Huh. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's pretty cool. It's really surreal. I mean, people, you know, people do pay attention to what you're doing. Mm. You may not always know it, but there are people out there watching you and paying attention to what you're doing, whether they like, comment or not. They may buy your book and never tell you. I mean, I've got, I've got, I think, 27 reviews of my book now, which isn't a ton, mm -hmm. but it's more than some people get. And some people only get one or two reviews because they don't ask. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They go back to the asking thing. I know that's something I need to do. I have a few reviews on mine. I know that would help to have more reviews there and on the yeah. podcast as well. For sure. Yeah. So go out there and review our books if you're ready. <laughs> Either one of our books, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, when it's great when people review your radio show, too. I ask people to do it. Mm. Yeah. And it goes back to we use that dating analogy. You're, you're not going to have that date with person if you don't ask. And mm. yes, you may have the no date still, even if you do ask. But there's that chance that you do get the date. So sure. go ask for it. Just like the review, ask for that review and maybe you get it. Maybe you don't, but you yeah. better off than you were by not asking. Yep. So the more, more often you ask and you know, maybe that gets people to, maybe they're just like, Oh, I didn't even know you had a book. I didn't even buy it. Let me go buy it real quick. And yeah. I, I don't want to give a review if I haven't read it or anything, right. but I do want to ask you real quick is I've seen a few other people, I know James Golden also did kind of the same thing where he had several people write a book and it was millionaire dad. So kind of, I guess, similar, if you will, but how was that experience of taking other people's thoughts and putting that into one book versus doing your own book with your own yeah. thoughts? It, it was really fun because I got to hear other people's dad stories and mm. You know, my dad didn't always see eye to eye on things. We ended well, though. But it's a great reminder that, you know, my relationship with my dad was better than a lot of people's relationships with their dads. Mm. And hearing people share their stuff. And sometimes the things you learn about someone is how not to be like them. Yeah. And so that's how I helped people extract their lessons. I didn't have a great relationship with my dad. It's like, well, sometimes we learn who to be by who not to be by watching what someone is and you don't want to be like them. Maybe you learned about how to be a great dad by doing the opposite of how your dad raised you. Maybe. Yeah. No, that, that's how I've learned some of the things, not from my dad per se, but just in, in general mm -hmm. in life, I see the way people do things and I'm like, I'm going to do the opposite of that. I don't yeah. like the way that looks or how it's yeah. turned out. <laughs> and so it was really great to involve other people. And, you know, the real cool thing is uh, they'll promote because they're in the book too. Mm. And they'll yep. share it out. Yep. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So, Brian, I really appreciate the time. And there's so many nuggets you gave throughout here. And, and like I said, a lot more marketing than I completely expected. But I love it. It was very valuable. And I know, I know the audience got a lot out of this episode. But I want you to be able to give one more piece of advice for them. If they're really stuck on not being able to get their message out there, what's something that hopefully you can give that piece of advice to them to get them over that hurdle? Yeah. I think the number one thing is to figure out what your message is. What do you want people to do, to think, to believe, to act about your topic or your idea when they're done reading it? How do you want to impact people? What legacy do you want to leave? What message do you want to share that could possibly help them? Think about it like this. Maybe, maybe the story you're telling is just one long piece of advice that you're sharing with somebody that's going through something that you've already been through, what would you tell them? Hmm. Sometimes your best clue to what to write your book about is to ask other people, if I was to write a book, what would you expect it to be about? Hmm. Answer may surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I can, I can see how that would change the perspective a lot mm -hmm. and rather just think about what yep. you would talk about. You're you know, mm -hmm. thinking about what the person would want to yeah. see or what you would want to tell somebody else by teaching them. Right. And sometimes what I run into is people have so many ideas in their head. I ask them, do you think you're trying to write more than one book at a time? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what's going on. You've got so many ideas that you can't triangulate and cross cross reference them all at once. Mm. So have a separate notepad. This idea goes with this book. This idea goes with this book. This idea goes with this book. Right enough that you won't forget about it and then just leave the rest of the alone and work on your current book. So mm. when someone like John Maxwell says, I have 10 more books in me, he's not trying to write them all at one time. He's got ideas in his head that he's probably written down somewhere, sort of his parking lot, if you will, of things that he wants to get to later. And he just check marks one at a time. Sometimes you might be trying to write more than one book at a time. And that might be where you feel overwhelmed and confused with all the amazing ideas that you have in your head. It's like, where do I start? We'll just start with one thing. Mm. Start with one thing and do something today to move in that direction. I love it, man. That, that's so powerful. And focus on that one message because yeah, if you try and cross-reference 10 different things that should be uh -huh. 10 different books, yeah. you're not going to get anywhere and you're not going to impact people as much as you could by diving into that one specific topic. So right. I really appreciate that. And Brian, if people want to find you, where's the best place to find you? You obviously are on several different areas, uh, yeah. but all, all intertwined perfectly, yeah. but yeah. where's the best place to find you? Well, you can find me on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. But if you want to learn more about what I do and how I can help you, go to writeabookforyou.com. Writeabookforyou.com. That, that's easy. <laughs> that's easy. I was surprised that was available. <laughs> yeah. Writeabookforyou.com. And that, that's your last name, correct? Not like literally like handwrite, if you will. No, it's W R I T. I did not. Do okay. The, okay. I didn't nice. Do the okay. Just thing. want to make sure. What was it a trick or it play wasn't on a words? Trick. No. <laughs> People ask how could you that you could have played on your last name. I'm like that's corny. Yeah. That's corny. Yeah. I'm not doing that. I'm not trying to be cute or funny. Write a book for you, W R I T E, write a book for you.com. And the word for is spelled out, write a book for you.com. All right, man. That, and yeah, I can't believe that was there and available. So that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So again, more marketing right there. Super easy to remember. Something that obviously you're, you are writing a book. So it goes right in there. <laughs> like, yeah. So perfect marketing tips, even right there at the end. But Ryan, really appreciate the time. And thank you for bringing in all the value that you did today. Thank you, Philip. It was great being here with you.